Our next presenter today is Diane Turner from Antheus Consulting, who will talk about GC and GCMS considerations when analysing food samples. Diane Turner graduated from the University of Warwick in the UK with a Master's in Analytical Chemistry after developing a technique in GC during her research project. After starting her career as an analytical chemist, she established an applications laboratory specialising in GC and GCMS. Since 2005, Dyne has been a trainer and consultant in gas chromatography, GC by GC, GCMS and related techniques where she shares her expertise and knowledge working with both instrument manufacturers and end users. Dyne is a member of the Royal Society of Chemistry and the British Mass Spectrometry Society, as well as a ChemNet Ambassador and a Women's Enterprise Ambassador. And so, without further ado, I'll turn the presentation over to Diane Turner. Diane? Thank you, David. Welcome, everyone, then, to the GC and GCMS considerations when analysing food samples. So, when doing any analysis, first we want to think about the big questions. Firstly, by analysing your sample, what questions are you trying to answer? Are you doing the analysis for qualitative or for quantitative purposes? Are you trying to look for target compounds or identify unknowns? Or maybe it's a mixture of both. First thing to think about is, can the samples and the analytes be analysed using gas chromatography in the first place? Or would a different technique, for example, liquid chromatography, be much better? And also, would the analysis using GC or GCMS give the qualitative or quantitative results at the level necessary to meet your objectives? So first, we want to think about the chemistries of the sample. We want to think about the chemistry of the analytes and also of the matrix. So let's first think about the matrix for food samples. So usually, this is a very complex matrix in these types of samples. So you could have organic matrix like fats, proteins, or sugars, and you could have inorganic matrix like water and minerals. And most of these types of matrix are not very GC amenable. Also, you could have very variable matrix between different foodstuffs. For example, even if you're just looking at different types of fruits to analyze those, there could be very varying amounts of matrix and also varying amounts of different types of matrix in these. So the same um, analysis and the same setup might not be applicable to every type of fruit. Often, when you're doing a sample preparation, a very high level of material of the matrix is co-extracted with using the sample preparation technique. This is absolutely fine, but a lot of these are matrix interferences. That means they're matrix components that interfere with either the separation and or the detection of your analytes using gas chromatography or GCMS. And how about the analytes? So the analytes are the compounds of interest. And in food analysis, they are very frequently problem analytes. And they could be a mixture or a range of these types of compounds. So most of the time, we're trying to do trace analysis. So particularly trace analytes in samples with higher matrix loading are much more difficult to detect and to separate from their very high concentration matrix peaks. The analytes could also be thermally labile. That means in our hot GC system, they could decompose. And therefore, the, t the compounds that we see in our detector would not be the same compounds that were originally in our sample. Many of the analytes found and looked for in food samples are active compounds. This means they could be irreversibly absorbed or broken down in our GC system. Also, we may be looking for some higher molecular weight compounds, and these can be dis subject to discrimination due to their lower volatility, and they're a bit more difficult to analyze using gas chromatography. So all of these types of compounds suffering from these problems um, need more care when choosing, when you're optimizing, and also when you're maintaining the analytical system if you want a very robust method. So let's first of all have a look at what we mean by our GCMS instrumentation. So first, 
we have our mobile phase. This is usually taken from a gas cylinder or a generator, depending on the type of carrier gas that you're actually using. And this has to move through a series of, of plumbing and fittings and usually through filters or traps to remove any impurities before moving into our gas chromatograph through usually um, something like an electric electronic pressure control module. It then moves into our GC inlet where it meets the head of our underscore column, through our underscore column and out, then out through into our detector, which could be either a GC detector or a mass spectrometer as shown here. Now when we take our sample, we first of all need to think about the collection of our sample and then about the sample preparation. And we're not gonna, don't have, we don't have enough time today to talk in depth about the sample preparation. So we're just going to be concentrating on the GC or GCMS instrument. So when we get to our GC or GCMS instrument, we still need to think about the introduction of our sample. So for a liquid injection, this would be using um, a syringe in an autosampler, where it's injected in, into the inlet, our sample is vaporized, transferred onto the head of the column, is then separated through our underscore column, and then move through into our detector. And if that's a mass spectrometer, first our analytes are ionized. They're then separated by the mass to charge ratio within the mass analyzer, and then move through into the detector where a signal is produced, which is collected and saved by the computer and is used to produce both our GC chromatogram. And again, if we have a mass spectrometer, also each data point will produce a mass spectrum as well. So, there's a lot going on in a GC or GCMS system, so we need to make sure that our analytes can move into the mobile phase, which is um, the gas, and then be moved, transferred throughout the system for separation and then detection. Thinking about the, the problem compounds that we've already discussed, so especially where we have trace analysis. So let's now go through the system itself and think about all the problem areas that we can encounter and things we need to think about when we're setting up our GC or GCMS method and all the parameters we need to think about optimizing and then any maintenance we may need to do to effectively separate those problem compounds, especially where we have a high level of matrix. So first, let's just think about what we need to um, our considerations in our GC or GCMS system for high molecular weight compounds. So first of all, let's just think about a sample introduction. So usually for high molecular weight compounds, it's much better to go and carry out a cold injection. This greatly reduces mass discrimination with the syringe and therefore we don't remove our syringe from the GC inlet, leaving behind the high molecular weight compounds still within the syringe needle which effectively would reduce the sensitivity of those compounds. If we did choose to use a hot injection with high molecular weight compounds, then we should always consider using a post-injection delay. That means that after we push the plunger down um, on the syringe when it's within the, the hot inlet, that then it just remains there for a couple of seconds just to enable um, evaporation of the high molecular weight compounds so they can then move into the GC inlet and the syringe isn't removed, taking away those, those molecules. We also need to think about our analytical column. So we need to ensure that our column, the maximum temperature of it, matches the volatility of the analytes. So to get very nice sharp peaks, we always want to try and separate an allutal analyte on the oven temperature ramp. So therefore, if we're limited by the column maximum temperature and the analytes don't come off on this temperature ramp because the maximum temperature is too low, then when they elute, actually on the final hold time, then we get quite a lot of band broadening occurring, depend on the molecular weight of the compound, and of course that then reduces our sensitivity. We also want to be thinking about minimizing our column film thickness to minimize band broadening of these high molecular weight compounds when they're being separated on the analytical column. And finally, with high molecular weight compounds, we need to ensure that our inlet, any transfer line and detector temperatures are hot enough to, for the molecules to maintain their progress through the system. So they don't encounter any cold spots where again, they would then slow down or get completely stuck. But the slowing down could again lead to band broadening and lower sensitivity in our analysis. 
let's move on to thinking about the analysis of trace compounds. So here we're thinking about the sensitivity of our instrument and trying to improve it as much as possible to go and get lower limits of detection. So in food safety analysis, foreign chemical substances can cause problems to human health even when they're present at very, very low concentration levels. And therefore, in the food analysis, methods are continuously striving to get to lower and lower limits of detection and limits of quantitation. So when we're thinking about our GC or GCMS instrument, any small issues where we get a loss of sensitivity throughout the system, even small ones, but where they then not so small um, reductions in sensitivity combine, then we get a, suddenly a large drop and we have a large problem occur in terms of our sensitivity of our system. So we need to think about and consider any small problems that can occur through the system. So when we're thinking about the improving the sensitivity of a method, there's two parts that we need to think about. First of all, when we talk about sensitivity, we're talking about signal to noise. So to improve signal to noise, we first of all need to think about reducing noise. And this is very often forgotten in gas chromatography. And the second part is how to increase our signal of our peak. So let's first think about noise reduction. So noise, can, there can be two types of this. First of all, electrical noise. Now, we can't really do very much about electrical noise except to make sure that we have a good electricity supply and that also all of our cables are well connected to get good connections in there. In terms of chemical noise in our GC or GC, GCMS system, this can come from a large multitude of locations throughout our system. So, sensitivity, we're thinking about our signal to noise ratio. Now we can see our noise just in here, and we can also see our signal. Now as we get band broadening occurring, our, um, the area of that peak is much more spread out, and the height of that peak above the height of the noise reduces, therefore reducing our sensitivity, and therefore reducing the ability, uh, the ability of us to say it is a peak, and it's definitely above the, the signal of the noise. So generally, we have, we could analyze very small peaks with very small areas, but the broader that peak is, the less likely we are to be able to see that. So broader peaks give us lower signal to noise ratios and therefore lower sensitivity. It also can reduce peak resolution, and that's the ability to separate two peaks. And again, this is very important because we're dealing in gas chromatography with food samples with lots and lots of peaks lots of matrix peaks, but also lots of analyte peaks as well. So we want to reduce the noise, and we also want to introduce our analyte as a sharp sample band on the analytical column, and then we need to maintain our sharp peaks shape throughout the GC system. So let's have a think about how to do those. So again, thinking about noise. So on the instrument, noise can come from a variety of different places. They could come from the impurities in the carrier gas. So generally, when we think about the, the, the carrier gas purity, the higher the purity, usually the lower the limits of detection. We also need to make sure that very clean and leak-tight gas plumbing is used. So when we're putting any fittings, any tubes in, connecting our gas source um, to our instrument, we need to make sure we're eliminating our background. And we also we want to um, install traps or filters to remove things like moisture and oxygen and hydrocarbons from our gas supply immediately at the back of the instrument. Also, noise can come from a carryover with a new water sampler. So we need to think about optimizing the number of post washes to ensure that our syringe is completely clean after we've injected the sample. And we also need to think about selecting a suitable solvent wash types. And we need to maintain this as well. So different solvents will be much better at cleaning the syringes than others. So generally, when we're um, selecting a solvent for our water sampler, we tend to go and use the same solvent as what we've extracted our sample in. But ideally, what we want to be doing is making sure that we use a solvent that not only cleans out the analytes, but these are usually at a trace level, but also making sure it's the best solvent to remove that much higher loading of matrix peaks. 
Another source of noise is septum blades. So first, again, we need to make sure that we go and select the correct um, septum type, which matches the solvent type that we're using. We also want to think about using a tapered syringe to try a um, syringe needle to reduce coring. So we don't want particles or a septum dropping inside the GC inlet, where we'll also be analysing um, any um, compounds um, from, from this piece of septum as well. So that will add to extra peaks within our background, or it may just gradually bleed out through the system, increasing our baseline. We also want to think about optimizing our septum purge flow if possible, so just to make sure we don't get any ghost peaks and also we don't get septum bleed going through into our um, GC column for analysis. A dirty inlet liner or inlet body can also give, um, cause us noise as our, our dirt gradually bleeds out of the system and adds to the baseline. Leaks can also cause noise. And um, this can come from the incorrect ferrules being used or cross-threaded fittings when we're installing our column. Also from leak leaking septa or any leaking press fit connectors if we are connecting a pre-column onto our main analytical column. Column bleed, of course, is a major contributor to our baseline and our noise level. So therefore, when we're trying to select our columns, try and use low bullet bleed columns. You always use columns within the temperature limits that are set for. Make sure that when that column isn't being used, it's being stored appropriately and being sealed from air. We also want to try and protect it from any inorganic or high molecular weight contamination that might be co-injected with our sample. So in this case, think about using a pre-column and therefore this um, high molecular weight contamination in inorganic material will therefore sit on the front of the pre-column and hopefully not damage our stationary phase in our analytical column. Also consider thinking about um, thinner films, um, thickness actually on the analytical column, that will cause lower bleeds, and of course shorter columns also overall will cause less column bleeds. Move on to our detectors, of course. If we um, are using contaminated GC detectors, again, any dirt might be bleeding into our signal. And also, if we're not using the correct flows of any gases into our GC detectors, um, and also the setup of our detector, if those are incorrect, again, that can lead to higher baselines and lower signal. And if we're using mass spectrometer, again, any dirt, any um, a dirty iron source or a mass analyzer can again continuously um, bleed or we'll see that background within our mass spectra and also within our chromatogram. Any leaks in the mass spectrometer will desensitize that. And also if we're using too high column flow for the vacuum system that we've got in our mass spectrometer, that will also increase our noise and therefore overall reduce our sensitivity. So we talked about instruments, but what about through um, um, sample matrix? And a lot of chemical noise, i.e. our matrix itself, comes from our sample. This can be either reduced through sample preparation step, but we may here risk loss of our analytes. So by removing the, the matrix, you might remove some of the analytes too. We could also, though, choose to inject more of the involatile matrix into the system. Then we could go and optimize our inlet temperature to minimize the transfer of this high molecular weight material onto our analytical column. We need to ensure that our inlet temperature is high enough to transfer as much of the volatile components, the, 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 um, the analytes as possible, but while minimizing the transfer of the high molecular weight matrix. If we're keeping that high molecular weight matrix inside our inlet liner, of course, we need to make sure that that is frequently replaced uh, so that we don't get the dirt bleeding through into our system. And also, of course, dirt can cause activity within our inlet liner, which we'll talk more about later. We can also think of um, dealing with this involatile matrix by trapping it onto a pre-column. So if, if it's held onto a pre-column, we would then trim that, the end of that pre-column frequently, and this would have very little effect on retention time shifting. But also, um, the problem with doing this is that we've got a potential that that involatile material may eventually move onto the analytical column and cause problems with matrix interference with our separation and our um, retention time shifting, depending on the type of matrix and the type of food um, sample that we're analyzing. <laughs> 
So the final way we could think about dealing with this high involatile material, actually on our um, pre-column or analytical column, would be to back flush this. So when we're back flushing, um, this is usually done after all of the compounds of interest have eluted from the column and gone into our detector. The carry gas flow is then reversed. This then prevents any unwanted, less volatile matrix contaminating our analytical column and detector, and it's flushed back through the injection port out to waste. And of course, by doing this, it's almost also much faster than trying to burn this involatile matrix off through our entire column and detector. And of course, causes less damage and also less um, dirtying of these instrument parts as well. So the diagram we can just show here, we can see a chromatogram at the top where we've got a wide range of compounds, and to the right-hand side of that chromatogram, we've got some matrix peaks. The, the chromatogram below shows where the matrix peaks have then been backflushed. We can also think about dealing with this matrix in a different way by using a selective detector to ignore the chemical noise. But you've got to remember that if you are transferring involatile matrix, onto your column that can still interfere with your separation to particular high levels of matrix. So, for example, a selective detector could be something like, like an electron capture detector. This would only see molecules capable of ca capturing an electron, in particular any um, pesticide, for example, that are halogenated. A flame photometric detector could either see sulfur-containing compounds or phosphorus-containing molecules. And also other types of selective detectors and mass spectrometers that we're going to talk about a little bit later. Now, moving on to thinking about our signal. So we can increase our signal by preparing more sample, by having a higher sample preparation concentration factor, or by doing a large volume injection into our GC inlet to get more sample injected and more analytes transferred onto the column. We can also think about some small parameters, like thinking that uh, ensuring that all our sample in the syringe is injected into the inlet, so optimizing our auto sample parameters like pre-washes and pumps to remove air bubbles, putting in a viscosity delay, and also our post-injection delay for hot injections, particularly for high molecular weight compounds. We also need to make sure we optimize our inlet technique to transfer all of the analytes onto the column quickly, making sure we've got a narrow sample band for sharp peaks. So here we need to make sure we optimize and select appropriately our inlet liner style, optimize our split this time, and if we're going to use them, optimize our pressure pulse and our pressure pulse time. Also, we need to ensure that our column is accurately installed into our inlet detector. Otherwise, we could lose, um, lead to a loss or the band broadening of either volatiles or involatile compounds. If we're using our GC detector, we need to be optimizing the flow. And if we do have a choice of detector gas types, use the gas which gives us the best sensitivity. Also, we need to think about optimizing our mass spectrometer parameters if we're using this. So things like iron source or mass analyzer temperatures, these need to be high enough to prevent condensation of analytes, but also minimal to reduce analyte degradation or reactions. And also it's shown to improve ionization of some analytes by um, increasing, sorry, these temperatures. Some applications, um, sorry, I'm going to start this up, um, slide again. We also need to ensure the column is accurately installed into our inlet and our detector. Incorrect installation could lead to a loss of or the band broadening of volatiles or involatile compounds. If we're using a GC detector, we need to optimize the flows, and if there's a choice of detector gas types, always use a gas which will give us the best sensitivity with that particular detector. With a mass spectrometer, we need to optimize our MS parameters for things like the iron source or the mass analyzer temperatures. These need to be high enough to prevent condensation of analytes, but minimal to reduce analyte, analyte degradation or reactions. But also, some applications recommend higher temperatures to reduce absorption effects. Also, we need to really optimize our acquisition rate, so it needs to be fast enough to get enough data points across the peaks for accurate identification and quantitation, but not too fast that the background increases and we lose sensitivity. And finally, our detector voltage. So increasing our detector voltage increases the signal, but it can also increase the, um, the, the noise signal. So overall, reducing our signal to noise. Oh, 
or not overall. Sorry, I'm going to start this again. We also need to ensure our column is accurately installed into our GC inlet or detector. So inaccurate installation could lead to the loss of or ban broadening of volatiles or involatile compounds. If we're using a GC detector, we need to optimize the flows. And if we have a choice of detector gas types, then use a gas which gives the best sensitivity for that detector. We also need to think about optimizing MS parameters, for example, the iron source or the mass analyzer temperatures. These need to be high enough to prevent condensation of analytes, but minimal to reduce any analyte degradation or reactions. However, it's been shown to improve ionization of some analytes by going to higher temperatures to reduce absorption effects. We also want to optimize our acquisition rate, so it needs to be fast enough to get enough data points across the peak for accurate identification and quantitation, but not too fast that the background increases and our overall signal to noise decreases. Also, if we are increasing our detector voltage, then this will increase the signal of our analytes, but also the signal of our noise as well. So therefore, overall may not give us a massive increase in signal to noise values. So let's just have a quick look at acquisition rate effects. So you can see here that as acquisition rate or scans per second reduces, we get less data points across the peak, and the peak shape um, decreases in terms of how, how nice and clear it looks and how reproducible it looks as well. So peak apex is more difficult to pinpoint, so for the correct identification. The signal to noise reduces, and also the peak area varies. Even if the same amount reaches the detector, quantitation is not accurate. And the final part with um, incorrect acquisition rate means that coalitions are more difficult to spot and to deconvolute, as we'll talk about later. So think about our mass analyzer in our mass spectrometer. We've got a range of different mass spectrometers we can select for the application. So quadrupoles, these are unit mass instruments, give us analytical resolution, and we can also do deconvolution as well. When we're running them in scan, this is less sensitive, but it's very good for identifying unknowns. If we run a quadrupole in selected ion monitoring mode, this is much more sensitive, but is for target analysis only, and interferences from matrix components are still possible. With a time, time of flight mass spectrometer, this is simultaneous acquisition, so we don't need to worry about having enough data points across the peak so much, particularly if this is a fast scanning instrument. These are unit mass instruments, and they're good for narrow peaks and deconvolution. Or our TOS could be a high mass resolution instrument, and this is very good for accurate identification as we can go down to multiple decimal places in terms of working out what the molecular ion is. Also, TOS gives us full mass spectra, so it's very good to ID identify both target compounds and unknown compounds. Now, very popular at the moment is to be using MSMS, so things like triple quads, also QTOS, etc. And here we can perform um, SRM, MRM, neutral loss scans, etc. as well. And in particular, these can give additional sensitive, um, sensitivity and or resolution for our target compounds and can also be operated in full scan. These, but these result in a lower mass spectral quality than a single quadrupole if you're using it for identifying unknown compounds. Now, there's thinking about MRM, so multiple reaction monitoring, over selected ion monitoring with a single quadrupole. Here we can see that detection of trace components in high matrix samples using a single quadrupole sorry, single quadrupole in selected ion monitoring mode versus a triple quadrupole in multiple reaction monitoring. And at the top here, you can see um, an example of a food sample where we've got selected monitoring on the left, and we can see our peak is quite difficult to identify and also to quantify, as we can see that we've got coalescing peaks of the same masses around that. But if we go across the multiple reaction monitoring um, using a triple quad, then it would give it a much cleaner picture, and we can have much more confidence in the fact that the, comp the peak is the comp target compound, the analyte that we are interested in. There's also some other examples here for in, in the environment and also life sciences. So moving on with trace analysis and improving our signal, we also want to minimize our band broadening. 
So to minimize it, we want to minimize longitudinal diffusion and elute our analytes from our analytical column as quickly as possible. So thinking here about the parameters, we want to minimize our column length, ensuring it's just enough for the required separation. Minimize our phase thickness, so it's just thick enough for the volatility and all the matrix loading. We don't want to overload the matrix on the column or the analyte. Minimizing the internal diameter, so it's just wide enough for the required capacity, so not only the analyte concentration, but also, again, the co-injected matrix. We need to ensure that any connections we have, say, for example, between a pre-column and a column, have a zero dead volume, ensure the system is leak-free, optimize our column flow to get a, get a good enough separation, but as short a runtime as possible, and also optimize our oven temperature program to elute our analytes on the temperature ramp, not when they reach the final oven temperature, again, to reduce our band broadening. So, now we want to move on to things to think about with thermally labile compounds. So, for example, a cold injection greatly reduces thermal degradation of our thermally labile compounds within the GC inlet. We also want to select a column that elutes all the analytes at the minimum temperature to reduce the likelihood of having thermal decomposition when the analytes are being separated in the column. The main thing is we want to be wary of any transfer line and sector temperatures. So we need to be high enough to eliminate any cold spots, otherwise we get slowing down of the analyte progress and this again would lead to band broadening. But it doesn't want to be too hot that increases the likelihood of thermal degradation in that section of the instrument. We also want to minimize activity within the system because this increases the likelihood of any thermal degradation occurring. And finally, I want to talk about active compounds. So many of the analytes in food analysis are very active. So first of all, we want to make sure we reduce any activity within our system. For example, hydrogen as a carrier gas is very reactive. So for certain compounds um, in food analysis, so very active compounds, we wouldn't want to be using hydrogen as a carrier gas. Also, we meant to make sure that our system's liner is deactivated. For example, the inlet liner. This is the main site of where active compounds um, react and therefore cause tailing. We want to minimize any liner packings that we're using. So we want to use a little bit maybe in the bottom of our liner to trap any dirt to ensure the dirt doesn't get onto the column. But also we want to optimize the position of the packing. Where is the, the best place for that little bit of packing material that, um, to be to actually go and do the job it's there to do, but minimize activity with our analytes? Any press bits or column connection systems also need to be deactivated. And our pre-column is very good to put in volatile matrix on the pre-column as well. So we need to make sure that's um, deactivated. But also, if we do have any matrix sitting on our pre-column, this can cause activity. It's almost acting like extra stationary phase in there. With our analytical column, this needs to be deactivated. And, and again, any matrix sitting on the analytical column can also cause activity. And again, it's just like extra stationary phase in there. So consider um, things like back flushing to remove that involatile matrix from our analytical column. Also, the matrix can damage the analytical column, and therefore it, it then exposes silanol groups, which are very, very active to these types of analytes. And finally, we want to be thinking about dirt throughout the system, so ensure it's well maintained. So any dirt becomes very, very active, and again, we'll then suffer from problems either from irreversible absorption or for catal from catalytic breakdown of these active compounds, or even just to um, have extra interaction with our compounds of interest and therefore lead to tailing of our peaks, which essentially, is, again, is like band broadening, reducing our signal to noise. So typical active compounds, things like phenols, organic acids, pesticides, amines, drugs of abuse, reactive polar compounds, and thermally labile compounds can all be thought of as um, active types of compounds. So we're here we're thinking about the chemistry of our molecules and the chemistry of the functional groups and the interactions that can actually go on with those. So interactions within our GC or GCMS system is um, wanted interactions are those with the, between the stationary phase and the analyte interactions on the columns. 
without those interactions, we wouldn't get separation of our analytes or our, sep our analytes away from our matrix. But we can have similar interactions occurring anywhere between an analyte and an active site in the GC system, and this is really what we want to minimize. So when we're thinking about stationary phase to analyze interactions, dispersion interactions are caused by charge fluctuations in molecules from the electron nuclear vibrations and they're usually related to the volatility of um, usually nonpolar compounds. But this is a very weak interaction, is not usually a problem with active compounds. However, things like dipole-dipole interactions is a permanent distortion of the structure. So for example, a permanent dipole, for example, in um, molecules like alcohols, esters, ethers, and nitriles, or dipole-induced dipole interactions are due to permanent dipole um, of polar compounds and polarizable molecules. So these sorts of interactions, again, can occur with any matrix that's left on the column, any um, damage to the analytical column, any sites that haven't been deactivated within our inlet system, and again, any dirt within our inlet system. Other types other types of interaction, things like hydrogen bonding, and this is usually the interaction of the hydroxyl groups, again, completely possible, where the types of compounds looked for in um, food samples and with these cyanide groups, either in the inlet liner or exposed parts of the analytical column. And this is the strongest bond of polar molecules. And then finally, pi pi interactions of of the electron p orbitals between the stationary phase phenol groups and the aromatic molecules, but again, this could also be leading from, from any dirt within our system, depending on the chemical problem, properties of that dirt within the system. So hydrogen bonding is our the strongest type of interaction, and then we have dipole-dipole interactions as well occurring. And all of these can lead to poor chromatography and reduce signal to noise in our GC or GCMS system. So liners need to be deactivated. We at glass um, is, has, it contains these cyanide groups, and of course these are OH groups that can undergo hydrogen bonding. Activity leads to this loss of peaks, tailing of peaks, and inconsistent results. And active compounds can either break down, or they can absorb to, or they can react at the active sites through these interactions of functional groups, as we've just discussed. So when we deactivate things like liners or our pre-column or our analytical column, then this applies an inert integral layer to the liner and packing material or column, etc. And deactivation methods include things like siltec or cyanization with, for example, hexamethyl disiloxane. And this then removes or it changes this its active site, making it less active to the analytes that we're analyzing. Also, though, we do need to be wary that deactivation does have a maximum temperature. So also with active compounds, we want to reduce the analyte residence time within the system. The longer the molecule sits around, the more likely it is to interact. So we need to ensure that we optimize the carry gas flow rate as so fast as possible while still maintaining the separation. If we're using mass spectrometer, ensure we're very wary of our MS pumping capacity, because if the vacuum is not as good, it will then increase the background in the mass spec and reduce sensitivity. We can even think about using constant or even ramped flow to analyze, uh, uh, sorry, elute our analytes quickly, again, minimize band broadening, improving our signal to noise. Our column length, minimizing while st still obtaining a good separation, so our analytes are then um, eluted from that column as quickly as possible. And always use temperature programming as soon as the sample is onto the column. So for example, our oven initial time should be equal to our splitless time. And finally, the GCMS tools that we can use if we're using a GCMS to analyze our food samples. So one example of this would be something like dynamic, dynamic baseline compensation, where this removes all of the background and it's much easier to see our peaks. And it just reduces a lot of that chemical noise, which is either co um, continuous or increasing, decreasing, and doesn't match what a peak shape should look like. Also, deconvolution. So deconvolution is analytical resolution. So this is detects the differences in mass spectra across a peak, and this can indicate coelutions. So when we look at a peak, the mass spectra across a peak should all be identical without any spectral skewing. 
So if there are slight differences in the ions there, any changes can indicate there's another peak under there. And with deconvolution, algorithm then derives the mass spectrum for that peak, which might be hidden underneath a very large matrix peak, enabling us to then have a cleaned up mass spectrum for identification purposes. Again, also for quantitation as well. Here's an example of deconvolution. So we can see here our peak marker 228. That um, gives us the mass spectrum at the top of, of this slide with our peak true. Whereas if we look in the middle, that's our reference spectrum giving us a good match. But if we looked at the mass spectrum at the very bottom, this is a mixed mass spectrum. So therefore, this is a mass spectrum which is coming from all of the peaks which are correluting in our system. And deconvolution then takes that mixed mass spectrum from the caliper at the bottom and pulls out a peak true, so a cleaned up mass spectrum, which gives us a good match. So, um, just a final summary. So when we're thinking about a sample analysis, we need to think about a whole GC or GCMS system. So multiple small losses in sensitivity at many different places can result in an overall large drop in our signal to noise ratio and therefore our sensitivity of our method. When you're thinking about optimizing or even developing a method for um, analyzing these difficult compounds in high matrix samples, then draw up a plan of the system and consider improvements to each part. Optimize each part of the instrument. Don't just go with the standard parameters, the standard setup for that part of an instrument, for example, a particular detector. And always remember that to improve signal to noise, you need to consider noise reduction as well as signal increases. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this presentation. It's quite a brief presentation and quite a lot to go through. Um, do you have any questions? Well, thank you, Diane, for that very informative presentation. Uh, we do have some questions. And the first question we have for you is, can you explain what you mean by ensuring septum type matches solvent type? OK, so some types of solvent are very, very good at eating away at certain types of septa. So of course, if the solvent um, being injected eats away at the, the, the septum, of course, what's going to happen is it's going to lead to a lot more septum um, bleed, which of course then increases our noise and reduces our overall signal to noise. So when our syringe goes into our autosample vial and then it moves across to the GC inlet, it has sample and solvent on the outside of that needle. It then pushes through that septum through into your GC inlet to go and inject. And of course, it's that solvent and, and of course, tiny bit of sample that's on the side of the outside of that needle that then comes in contact with the septum. And of course, if that solvent really likes that septum, is a, it will start eating away with it. And of course, not only then will you get larger amounts of septum bleed, but also you will reduce the lifetime of that septum, so you'll need to go and replace it more frequently. So it's always just worth stopping and investigating all the many different types of septa available on the market to ensure that this, the solvent that you're using is okay to use for the type of septum you want to choose. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question is, uh, can deconvolution be used with SIM? Okay, so with selected ion monitoring, we're only looking at a few different ions, um, but of course, some of those ions might be um, present in them, any matrix background, as well as in um, the, the mass spectrum of the analyte you're looking at. Usually for a particular analyte, you'll be choosing multiple ions, and therefore, not, hopefully, not all of those ions will be also in the, in the matrix mass spectrum as well. But yes, deconvolution can be, because then it can differentiate between the different peak shapes um, of those different ions, and also then lead to a, a cleaned up mass spectrum of the, the single ion, uh, sorry, the selected ion monitoring mass spectrum, um, as removing any matrix contribution. Okay, and I think the final question we have today, Diane, is um, can you explain what causes retention time shifts on the column? Okay, so I've briefly kind of touched on that today. But when we have high levels of matrix, you know, for example, say fats, which move on to the column, then if that's not removed from the analytical column, what can act like is almost like extra stationary phase. And depending on the chemistry of your molecule and the chemistry of that matrix, 
if it's more interaction than the stationary phase of the column would cause, then of course your peaks will come out later because they're going to spend longer interacting with that stationary phase. However, if there's less interaction of your analyte with that matrix sitting on the column, then of course those analyte molecules will just move over the top of it and they'll all move on faster through the column and elute earlier. Okay, well, once again, Diane, thank you very much for your presentation today. And if any more questions do come in, I'm sure that Diane would be happy to respond to them by email afterwards. Thank you.